super excited to be um, moderating this panel. Um, obviously, the biggest question is why we should be betting big or trusting or believing in DeFi. And to be honest, that sh I think that should be the first question that we can discuss. Uh, so, Alam, could you give us a few reasons why you think DeFi is the next big thing? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all in this space and we categorize DeFi maybe in, in some different ways. Um, but uh, for, for me, I think we're all in this space because of DeFi. We think, at least I think of Bitcoin as DeFi, why, why we, you know, sort of originally got into this. And all of this is sort of the evolution, right? Um, I, For me, um, personally, and I'd, I'd love to hear from, from Michael, who just made some big bets in this space, and, and Tom uh, also, because I know you've been... Uh, very vocal about it too is it's just you know the the fact that all of these products that we're participating with in the DeFi space are probably not that different from the products um, at a very very high level than sort of uh, the bankers and the people who can afford to participate in this in in those types of products have been able to participate in a very long time and to me this is sort of the next evolution of bringing it to the masses um, you know. I, I love and have been sort of you know, promoting that kind of stuff forever. We were doing crowdfunding stuff 10 years ago. So, uh, you know, that's, for me, that's, that's the main, main reason. I can give it a shot. Um, yeah, for us at Framework, it really kind of comes down to two uh, main components, which is that if you really break down the finance industry, and the infrastructure layers of the technology that underpins finance. Uh, there's been little to no innovation in the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, we're still using internet protocol technologies, uh, you know, web technologies, uh, ACH, you know, SMS, what, what have you, to transfer value around the world. Um, so that is the, the first and foremost, but also we're talking about probably the largest single market in the entire world, finance. Um, and these two things lead to in orders of magnitude, lower cost or lower barrier to entry for developers to now build in this developer sandbox that we have uh, as DeFi. And what comes of that, unclear, um, but when you have orders of magnitude change, that usually leads to rapid innovation, rapid iteration. And uh, that's what gets us excited about this. Uh, you know, the largest market now has a new building block uh, sandbox to be able to play with. I think for us, it's just everything is going to be decentralized, right? Whether that is uh, finance or other industries. And, um, you know, I'm with Alon in the sense of uh, I ultimately go back to Bitcoin is the most valuable uh, DeFi application. Uh, there's many, many others that are being created right now that we think have value. Some we've invested in, some we're just watching. Uh, but ultimately, when you decentralize and digitize a lot of this, what you're doing is you're expanding the market opportunity. So historically, if you wanted to participate in a lot of financial services, you had to have a US-based bank account. You had to be somewhere uh, kind of in the Western world. Um, and now when you get that digital decentralized system, uh, you can basically expand those services and access to uh, billions of people who were previously kind of cut out from the system. And so we think that that's really interesting. Uh, it obviously starts and, and ends with kind of a, a unit of account uh, being digital and decentralized, something like Bitcoin. Um, and then you go out from there and, and currently most of the things around the Bitcoin ecosystem are centralized uh, infrastructure. If you look in the uh, Ether and Ethereum uh, community, most of the infrastructure uh, that's being built there is decentralized. And so what we think is basically going to happen is one of two things, either you're going to bring the Bitcoin um, kind of core unit of account that's digital and decentralized into that DeFi system. There's things like Rapid Bitcoin and TBTC and a bunch of other uh, attempts to do that. Or what you're going to do is you're ultimately going to end up building um, kind of decentralized digital infrastructure uh, around Bitcoin that may be on uh, the Bitcoin protocol, could be on other protocols. Um, I think that's still up for debate. And, and frankly, I think that there's going to be coexistence. And I, I don't think that we're going to kind of live in a world where uh, only one protocol exists. Uh, similar to what we saw with the internet, right? There used to be 60, 70, 80 protocols. Now we're down to about five or six that really matter. I think same thing's gonna happen here. Um, but ultimately I think that the resounding message we have when we look at this stuff is, it's obvious it's gonna happen. I think the focus of many people in the space right now is on technology. Uh, and I think that's the wrong focus, that the focus needs to be on product. Uh, and 
that doesn't sound like there's a big difference there, but it, it's kind of like running around and saying, look at what I made the technology do is one thing that impresses other developers that impresses other technical people, but ultimately the user doesn't care, right? What the user wants to be able to do is use a product. They don't care what the underlying technology is, how it works. They just want to be able to say, Hey, I want to take that loan. I want to be able to use this money. I want to be able to uh, do X, Y, or Z. And so I think that um, over time, you kind of start with the technology and eventually build products. That's really what we're waiting to see is like, who are, who are the teams that are going to build products that are usable by uh, mainstream audiences uh, and happen to be decent? Centralized, right? That's kind of the holy grail. Uh, there haven't been too many of those yet, but but I do have confidence that they're coming, and so that's what we're we're kind of excited about, and, and an area that we're spending a lot of time trying to unpack um, is that usability of the decentralized infrastructure um, for things like Bitcoin. So, do you think that this is the biggest issues that most DeFi upcoming DeFi companies are getting wrong, and uh, perhaps what are the biggest challenges as well? So. You mentioned inter interoperability between the DeFi projects. Would that be something that uh, should really be the focus on? Yeah, again, um, interoperability is definitely one piece of it. But, but again, that's like a technical component. Nobody cares right about interoperability. If you got on the street in New York and you talk to somebody and you say, hey, I've got a place for you to get a better mortgage or a better loan or use better money, they're going to say, why is it better? And the word interoperability, if that's the language you use, they don't care, right? They don't even know what that means. Instead, if you say to somebody, it's cheaper, it's faster, um, you can do it in a place where you previously didn't have access to this. Um, you know, those types of things are actually what matter. And when you think about the services you use in, in the legacy world, like nobody really understands the technology stack of the money. Nobody understands how credit cards work. Nobody understands how loans work uh, from a technology standpoint. And so what they ultimately end up doing is they use a product and all of the technology is kind of um, you know, invisible. And I think that's where we've got to get here. Uh, now, the good news is the way you get there is you've got to build the technology, right? So that, that's kind of what the early stages are and what we're doing today. Um, but I do think that, uh, that there's kind of this user experience and user interface and, and uh, kind of really product experience that has to uh, be upgraded significantly for the mainstream folks to start using this. Um, that's kind of on the path we're on, but it just takes time to do. And so we're encouraged that that's coming, um, but, but that's definitely a big focus for us. It's just the usability. Yeah, I think I, I'm constantly uh, yelling at, at uh, the community about stuff like this all the time, too, because, you know, people, the, the average consumer, uh, uh oh, I hope uh, his, his connection works, but the, the, um, the average consumer, again, do, doesn't care, right? We have uh, DMM, uh, you know, the portfolio company, so full disclosure, I'm, I'm going to name drop them, but like they earn people six and a quarter percent interest, and we just launched an app to make it really, really simple. None of the consumers care that we had to do a partnership with Prime Trust so that they could custody the, the crypto and the stuff and do all the stuff and all the details and whatever. They care that there's a simple app they could earn six and a quarter percent interest on, and that's all. My mom doesn't give a crap uh, that JavaScript and CSS and HTTPS is all somehow involved in her seeing her grandkids' pictures on Facebook. Uh, she just knows that it works and there's a cool app. And guess what? That app uses other programming languages too. So like, it, it really, really doesn't matter. Um, uh, you know, so uh, I think if, uh, while we wait for Alex to hopefully refresh and get back on screen, Michael, um, <laughs> love to hear some of, some of the latest updates from you and where you're thinking sort of the next, the next steps um, are, are going. Because you, you guys, congratulations. I just saw uh, some, big, some recent big announcements. Yeah, thank you. Um, we okay. have been approaching DeFi, well, maybe taking a step back. We, we last year, uh, launched this first fund um, with the primary focus on DeFi uh, back when that was probably not the most popular thing. Um, we have since been making investments in what we like to call money Legos. These money Legos are different uh, aspects of the DeFi infrastructure stack and, and essentially mapping it onto the traditional finance ecosystem. Um, so this comes by the way of uh, Chainlink, Synthetics, um, some other ones, uh, uh, Aave just was announced. Um, and we see those as the building blocks, like I mentioned, to build other components on top of it. 
Um, and what we're looking at now, the things that we're excited about are, are sort of taking that next step. Once you have automated market makers, once you have robust data feeds, once you have collateral pools that you can leverage to build synthetic assets, uh, the question then becomes, well, what can you build with that? And, and the things that we're looking at most, uh, most now are uh, options markets, so building you know, options decks, um, insurance products, so taking some of the things that we uh, are using quite frequently and actually building cover around them um, and uh, really thinking about how we can expand the scope um, to, to Palm's point. How can we get this in the hands of everybody else? I think the biggest issue that we run into with most of our companies is usability. Uh, it, it's a MetaMask transaction. It's an Ethereum uh, address. It's, you know, it's clunky. It's hard to use. Um, I, I've barely been able to convince my parents to use it, uh, but that's because I'm in this space and, and nobody else is really able to. Um, and so I think once we can uh, move layers around to be able to get the usability to the point where you can have more than tens of thousands of people using it, you know, that, that's sort of the other wrapper on top of all of this that we're looking at. Um, so it's trying to solve the usability problem. Well, yeah, I'm back. So apologies about that, I'll search. Um, so I wanted to talk about the, sort of the future of the sector. Obviously right now we're seeing a lot of uh, volatility around tokens and uh, should we really be focusing on the short-term price volatility of those tokens or we should be focusing on the long-term future of the whole ecosystem and where that's heading um Lon, could you yeah i mean look i don't i don't think it's a secret to anybody that most of the stuff uh in terms of what is being lumped under the DeFi um kind of uh, nomenclature today probably won't be around in 10 or 15 years, and, and, and that's okay. Um, you, you always got to ask yourself when you see uh, projects or, or uh, companies or, or kind of efforts being done uh, in a new industry like this, two things. Uh, one, is this a technology play? Uh, or two, is this a society slash belief play? And so if you take something like Bitcoin, for example, uh, the technology is important, but ultimately money is a belief system. And so uh, you build a network effect around a belief. Um, and in my opinion, uh, that belief and buy-in and that network effect buy you time to actually build out the technology. In many of these other situations, what you've got to do is it's a technology play. So let's say whether you're um, Goldman Sachs, which today, I don't know if people saw yet, uh, there's a, a gentleman from inside the bank who's now the new global head of digital assets uh, at the bank. And he basically came out and said, look, in five to 10 years, you could see the entire financial system being run on digital assets and settlements and transactions all being done natively on chain. So I, that's a pretty big statement to come from uh, somebody at Goldman Sachs who comes out of like the traditional investment banking world. Now he's specifically talking about a technology thing. And the only way that a Goldman Sachs all the way down to most retail people uh, come over to, let's say, um, you know, earning interest or uh, taking a loan or something like that is the technology has to be superior, right? And that technology can be superior in being cheaper and being faster and providing access somewhere that it, it otherwise wouldn't, uh, maybe more secure, safer, whatever. So you've really got to kind of separate this out. And, and the reason why I separate those out is most of the DeFi stuff is technology and you just have to bet on the fact that the technology is going to improve. And so some portion of the people who are building today won't innovate, they'll end up dying. Uh, and some portion will innovate and they'll kind of stay ahead of the curve, right? And go back to the internet. We saw this over and over again. Amazon has reinvented itself, you know, what, 10 times at this point uh, and ends up being one of the most successful companies. Apple since the 70s and 80s, again, reinvented itself over and over and over again. So I think that naturally that's just how markets uh, kind of grow. Uh, but but the technology is important and, and so people are going to have to stay ahead. In an industry like this, it changes so fast. Like think back to two years ago, what people were talking about to today and how much has changed. And, and not only in the kind of regulatory and, and macro environments, but just, just in crypto alone, just in the things that people were excited about, right? We're, we're so, so far ahead. You know, stable coins, for example, had almost no adoption you know, two or three years ago. Now they're some of the most popular um, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies. And so it's like that little change in a 24 month period is a significant inflection point in an industry that you know, in the future we believe will be trillions of dollars. You look back and those assets, somebody had to build them, they got built. And so now we're off to the races. Like there's a hundred more things in line there that, that I think uh, we've got to do. Uh, it just takes time and, and frankly, it takes effort from uh, people to build the technology. 
the, the thing I'd add there is that the most scarce resource that we have in the space is world-class entrepreneurs. And if there is a speculative element to it, what, what that draws is in, in is interest. And when you can have uh, speculation um, as a form of entertainment, as a form of uh, attraction, it, it's something that allows people to get into the space or enables them to get into the space. Uh, and because people are now bought in, they're owners of the networks, they're owners of the, of the protocols, the technologies themselves. Uh, and when you have the world-class entrepreneurs starting to come in, what that helps us understand is that it's not it's not going to be the Goldman Sachs of the world that are the winners in this ultimately. It's going to be the internet native, the blockchain native companies that are built in the next five years that are the new Goldman Sachs uh, for this digital value uh, ecosystem that we're building. Um, and I, I think DeFi is what we're calling it right now. I think DeFi eventually becomes just finance uh, in the same way that the internet is content and commerce. And uh, it, it's going to be the exact same transition. We're probably at the start of about a 20 to 30 year period. Yeah, on, on top of that, I'll just throw in, you know, that we, um, you know, we, we are are building these tools and essentially, you know, actually your, your question was about the day-to-day -day price. And I think we all have these long-term visions. So clearly we're not focused on the day-to-day -day price more than the long-term, at least at DGH and, and also what, what Pop and, and Michael just said, but at DGH, we're early venture style investors. It just so happens that companies have tokens now versus equity or versus um, other kinds of, of instruments. Uh, but what i think is is really crazy and interesting is that these banks at least as we know them will definitely not exist some of them will will acquire some of the companies in the space if they're acquirable d5 projects aren't really acquirable but they could integrate them they could participate with them and essentially i think there's two things that will happen you know the dinosaurs will die um and then some some will 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 evolve but it's only like getting back to the first initial uh uh, you know, um, thing that we mentioned is is that when the certain dinosaurs die, they'll go away. New people will come back and take their place. Some of these DeFi projects and things like that. But the rest of them, the ones that do adapt, are going to have to create more transparent, more fair products that every single person will have to. Uh, you know, there's not going to be these Wells Fargo's creating millions of accounts on users' behalf when things are just that much more transparent because people, it's not as sticky anymore either. You know, you can jump from product to product much easier. You don't have to leave your house. You, you just get another app on your phone. It's, it's so much easier to, to leave when service sucks. Um, and so I think, you know, the long-term vision for this whole industry is, is, is huge. Um, and it'll transform like, you know, like Michael said, it's like when we talk about security tokens and digital securities, it's just going to be securities. Just like nobody talks about, I don't know if you guys remember, but about 10 years ago when things started getting um, more regularly signed digitally, like e-signing documents with DocuSign and things like that, people called those digital documents. Now we don't consider them digital documents. They're not digitized at all. They're still a piece of paper that's, you know, a PDF that whatever, but like, in, in the sense, if that were the case, then every single security that most of us have participated in were digital securities too, because we never actually printed them out to sign them, or at least 90% of them, right? So the same thing is gonna happen here. You know, uh, People aren't gonna look at, at you know, um, DeFi products as DeFi, it's just gonna be the best practices for the financial services industry. Alex, I think you might have muted yourself. Um. Yes, I have. So we've got three, just three minutes to go. Uh, and uh, just wanted to throw out a really quick question to round up this conversation. Um, when the DeFi projects come to you, what is the, the thing that you're looking for, essentially? So would it be uh, the people, the idea, the application, and um, what drives you to invest, essentially? What drives you to work with them? Um, yeah, I mean, look, we, we always care a lot about the people. Uh, I think that's probably one of the, the things we always go back to is when we make a mistake, we invested usually in the wrong people. And when something goes really right, we invested in the right people. Uh, we've just seen that happen over and over and over again at all stages of investing. Um, in terms of what we look for uh, outside of people is, uh, frankly, our opinion doesn't matter. 
right? And I think that's one of the, the key advantages that we have is, um, you know, I've run a lot of these growth teams and I can look at the data. I can quickly tell you, hey, it's either working or it's not. The market's adopting this or it's not. Um, and one of the things that uh, is really interesting is you can see something, even if you only have a thousand or 5,000 users, I can pretty much look at the data and tell you if this doesn't get messed up, it's either going to take off or, it's, or you got more work to do in terms of fi finding product market fit. And so I think that's one of the key pieces is just, there's a lot of people who, you know, have their own personal opinions. We ultimately say the market's going to decide. The market's going to be the one to uh, to determine the winner, and we want to understand what that underlying data is. And if the data is encouraging and kind of shows us the right stuff, then, then we get really excited. And in many cases, we just say, "Hey, look, the technology's cool. You know, you're great, but uh, but the market isn't yet ready for this for whatever reason. You you got to do more work to find kind of product market fit." Um, I will say, you know, we're venture investors, uh, earliest money in to, uh, you know, series a, uh, with multiple many year time horizon for everything that we do. So, so the typical benchmarks are things that we look at, you know, team product market, uh, the thing that we do that's different. Uh, and I think, you know, something that we promote with any of our portfolio companies is community. Uh, and this is what's the telegram looking like? What's the discord looking like? Who are the, who are the most staunch supporters, um, and fervent followers, and what that becomes in our perspective is that that's your unfair advantage. That's your customer base. That's your partnership uh, base. That's your marketers right there. They're the ones that are putting together memes. They're the ones that are promoting this in other channels. They're the ones that are pulling over liquidity. They're, that becomes something that is unique and differentiated for you that, that can't be replicated. You know, all this is decentralized technology. Liquidity is one thing and liquidity sloshes around like we're seeing right now in DeFi. Code is not proprietary, so you can't build a defensible moat around proprietary code. But the thing that you can build that's proprietary is your community. Uh, and if those people are sticking with you, uh, that's something that's unique. Yeah, I, I agree with, with both of these guys. Um, they're uh, incredibly smart, great guys. Um, I think we're, we're almost out of time, so I'll just say um, you know that uh, we we look mostly at the team. We look at at the community and things like that as well. But we're super early. You know, a lot of times we're the first check into a company with with uh, a couple of people with very little traction or barely more than an idea. And so the people outweigh all other factors because you know, do we believe that they'll be successful in creating that community and and in building this product? And that that's you know where where we focus, you know, 99% of our, our efforts and time. Thanks. Thanks guys for, for joining us. I know uh, Alex really leading this one, but uh, I appreciate it since we're producing it. Thank you, and thank you Alex. Thank yeah. you guys very much.